moved from the campus to the crime lab, to crime fiction, to crime drama. So many, many, many changes in my narrative. Um, when I was an undergraduate, I had no idea what I wanted to do. I think I had five different majors until I finally took a course in physical anthropology. I was always interested in archaeology. I was always interested in the humanities. But I'm also, my mind works in that I am a hard science type. I need to be able to measure something and weigh it and photograph it. So when I took physical anthropology and I learned all about the human skeleton about bones, I was hooked. And I went on and I got my graduate degrees in physical anthropology, but with a specialty in bioarchaeology. It intrigued me how much you could learn from a human skeleton. You learn the basics, what I think of as the biological profile. A skeleton can tell you an individual's age, their sex, their ancestry, their height, but it can also tell you a lot about their life and their activities and their health and perhaps their death, the type of trauma that they might have experienced, blunt instrument, sharp instrument, the type of scavenging that might have happened with their remains following death, the type of diseases they might have had, such as arthritis or dental issues. So in bioarchaeology, I was able to bring together my interest in humans, in culture, in people, and their biology by excavating and analyzing their skeletal remains. I thought I would spend my whole career in academia. I'm on the faculty at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte, molding young minds. And I thought I would spend my whole career doing that, studying ancient peoples and writing up research projects about that. Then a few years back, and you're going to notice that as I talk about these changes in narrative, I'm gonna be really vague about how much time passes between each one because we're really not going to address the issue of my personal age. But sometime in the, the mid 80s, let's say, Two detectives visited my laboratory at the University of North Carolina because I was the bones lady, and they had a problem. A child had gone missing, and three months later, a small skeleton was found in a remote wooded area. And they wanted to know if I could help them determine if those little bones were, in fact, the remains of this missing child. So I agreed, reluctantly, I agreed to help them with that case. And I was struck by the relevance of what it was I was doing, that I could actually help give that family closure. They might not like what I was telling them, but at least I could give them answers. And also the fact that I could help law enforcement to bring someone to justice for what had happened to that little girl. So I made the shift into forensic anthropology. I'd been aware of it earlier, but it really wasn't the narrative I thought I'd be following. The basic skills are similar, knowledge of the human skeleton, but there are also a lot of differences. When you're studying ancient populations, addressing archeological questions, you're really talking about groups of people, populations of people. But in working in forensic contexts, you are asked to address questions of specific individuals who experienced specific death episodes. Yes, in both you answer, are these remains human? Yes, when did this individual die? But now we're talking about days, weeks, or very short time periods, not hundreds or thousands of years. And then who is this individual? Can we actually put a name on these bones. What was the manner of death? And in a medical legal context, there are really only five. It's suicide, homicide, accidental, natural, or unknown. We really don't talk in those terms, archeologically. And then, of course, what happened to this particular individual after they died? Yes, there is a similarity in that you go out and you recover human remains, but what you do in a forensic context is really quite different. I go out with an official police team. I never go off on my own, like the heroine of my books does in the early books. She doesn't do that so much anymore. But I always go with an official team and we follow very specific crime scene protocol because anything we're recovering is now going to become evidence. 
Another situation I might be involved in is an exhumation, where there's been a coroner's request or a court order. We have to go out and get the coffin out of the ground. And there we have the advantage of having records, cemetery records, which tell you, theoretically, where the coffin you're looking for is supposed to be. I have been in situations where the coffin we wanted wasn't actually in the place it was supposed to be. So sometimes that can be a bit challenging. Sometimes we get what we call a clue as to where the coffin might be. <laughs> Another difference is that you don't just work with nice clean bones in a forensic setting. You might work with decomposed bodies, mummified, mutilated, dismembered, burned, or perhaps just skeletal remains. I'm also asked to look at trauma that's very different than anything I might see in people who died thousands of years ago. I might be asked to look at where did the bullet enter, where did the bullet exit, for example. I might be asked to look at cut marks, determine if they were made by a hand saw or a mechanical saw. Again, this is not something we'd be looking at with ancient peoples. And I will be asked to testify in court, and that is not something that I would be doing in an archaeological context. So I really like liked the relevance of that. You cannot be wrong when you tell someone, yes, this is your missing family member, or when you testify in court, because you're really going to impact someone's life. So I changed the narrative, I retrained, I became board certified, which is also not important in archaeology, but is in very important in forensic anthropology, all the forensic sciences, because it's necessary for the courts, for law enforcement, to know who are legitimate experts. And board certification is a process by which that is done. So come, oh, a few years later, and two things happened. I made full professor at the university. That's the highest rank to attain at a university. So I was free to try something new. I was free to, to not publish another scientific article or textbook. I had also just worked on a serial murder case in Montreal, so I had a very interest, and that was completely finished and litigated, so I had a very interesting idea, concept for a story, and I had the freedom to try something new. So I decided to change the narrative. I decided to write fiction. I had never done fiction before. Well, my resume, but other than that, I really... <laughs> I really hadn't tried my hand at, at fiction. So I wrote a book, I created a fictional protagonist, Temperance Brennan, and uh, created a story based on this actual case, but changing all of the details for both legal and ethical reasons. Um, and that did pretty well. So I wrote another book, and, and that went pretty well. So I wrote a few more books, and then I wrote a few more books after that. Each of the books, I try to take the reader into a different arena in which forensic anthropologists work. Uh, the first book, Deja Dead, is based on the work I do for a large government facility, the Laboratoire de Sciences Judiciaires de Médecine Légale in Montreal. The story was based on uh, a serial murderer who operated in Montreal, and the elements that were of interest, the elements to which I testified in his trial, had to do with dismemberment the type tool that was used, but more importantly, the pattern of the dismemberment, which said something about the behavioral profile of the perpetrator. By the way, for those of you that don't read French, la psychopath, that means the psychopath. <laughs> okay, so there are the cut marks. Um, this book, Dr. de Jour, was forensic anthropology in a different arena, working for a private entity. I was hired some time back by the Catholic Church, the Archdiocese of Montreal, to exhume and analyze the remains of a woman who died in 1714, Jean Lebert, and who had at that time been proposed for sainthood. So one of the steps in that process, if there are remains, is to verify that they are in fact the correct remains. So in this book, we learn about how forensic anthropology works in a private context. Fatal Voyage takes you into the world of disaster recovery. I, for many years, was part of the Disaster Mortuary Operational Response Team system in the United States. It's a network that's activated in situations of mass disaster. We worked sorting out the mess following uh, Hurricane Katrina. We sorted out this, this genius in Georgia that instead of cremating the bodies, stacked 300 bodies at the back of his property. But mostly, we work in commercial airline disaster. So we learn about that in this book. 
Ironically, one month after Fatal Voyage was released, I ended up going to the Twin Towers and doing exactly what I had been researching and writing about for the previous two years. Grave Secrets takes us into the world of uh, human rights abuses. I testified at the United Nations Tribunal on Genocide in Rwanda, and I also helped the Forensic Anthropology Foundation of Guatemala exhume a mass grave. So we learn about that in this. Don't panic, I'm not going through every single book. <laughs> Spider Bones, um, I worked as a consultant for the United States military labs out in Hawaii. We promise our service persons, if we send you overseas, we will find you and we will bring you back. And the remains are identified at the Central ID Laboratory in Honolulu, Hawaii. So I consulted to the Joint POW MIA Accounting Command for many years, and we learn about that in this book. So I was doing that for a while. And in 2005, I was approached by two gentlemen who wanted to take Temperance Brennan and put her on the small screen. Take Temperance Brennan and create a television show. I'd had a couple of offers up until that point. None of them was really the right one. But we were on the same page about what we wanted the show to be. Our showrunner, by the way, is a good Canadian boy, Hart Hansen. So the main premise of the show is that you have Celie Booth, who's uh, an FBI agent, working with Temperance Brennan, who's a scientist, he calls them squints, and Seely Booth, they have very different approaches to crime solving. Seely Booth believes in gut instinct and emotion and good old fashioned legwork, whereas the scientists, the squints, believe in hypothesis formation and testing, never speculate, always need hard physical evidence. So we thought that the two, the, the, the conflicting approaches to crime solving would make for good television and some humorous moments. So that is the central theme of, uh, of the show, which came to be Bones. I worked as a producer on that show, changing the narrative again, something I had never done before. I mainly promised myself I would just never let my cell phone go off while I was on set and we were shooting, and I would never trip over any of the equipment on set. Those were my goals. Um, but I did work with our props people, for example, to make sure that uh, our uh, cadavers, if you've ever seen the show, it always opens with a very messed up set of human remains. They're all acrylic. If you're a little squeamish, don't worry. You're just looking at plastic right here. So all of them are very authentic although they are made of acrylic. We get a little more attached to some than to others. Um, there's Hart Hansen on the left, and I'm the one on the far right, and then the lady in the lake from our pilot is the one in between us. The other thing I helped with was designing our sets. Um, our science, my job essentially was to keep the science as accurate as possible. So our sets, everything came from medical supply houses or biological supply houses. You can see the forensic platform there. On the right, that is Tempe television, Tempe's um, storage facility with her wonderful floor to ceiling storage cabinets and the backlighting and the bones kind of gleaming through. This is my actual storage facility <laughs> at my lab in Montreal. So we did take a few liberties for the magic of television. Well, somewhere around the fifth season or so of the show, my executive producer said, why don't you write a script, a screenplay? I said, I've never written a screenplay. He said, well, you'd never written a book, and that worked out pretty well. So I said, okay. So I wrote a screenplay, which is very different from writing a novel. For one thing, you do what's called breaking the story. You go into the writer's room, and collectively, there are these terrifyingly empty white erasable boards. And at the end of one to three weeks, collectively, you have hammered out your storylines, all six scenes, in the case of our show. So there I am, after we've hammered out. Um, my first episode, so then you pitch it, and it has to be approved, and once it's approved, and this is very different too, I, I'm not used to this from writing my novels, um, after you pitch it and it's approved, you're then sent to script, and then you actually write the script. So it's a very, very different process of write, in many ways, those are just a few, from writing a novel. So again, I was changing the narrative and trying something new and moving out of my comfort zone. So my first episode was actually called The Witch in the Wardrobe. I think that's still one of my favorites. Yeah, this is my son. <laughs> my son is a very bright guy, but he's also a little weird. He uh, went to law school, 
And he practiced law for about two or three years. And then he came to me and he said, I really don't like practicing law. Why don't we write a young adult series? And I said, I've never written young adult literature before. I have no idea how to write young adult literature. Well, he was a litigator, so he was very persuasive. So I agreed. So in fact, we did write a young adult series of novels, which is something I never pictured myself doing, never thought I would be doing. And um, Tori Brennan, Temperance Brennan's 14-year-old great niece, is the heroine of those. And she and her friends undergo a change in the first book, they're not zombies and they're not, they're not vampires, but they acquire some special perceptive abilities and they use those skills along with their love of science to solve cold cases and mysteries at kind of a middle school or high school level. And the reason we did this is we wanted to make kids understand that science is cool, science can be fun, and particularly young girls. Kids, or if you're 90 and you're retiring and thinking of writing a book, my advice would be, go for it. Thank you.